on World News Tonight. Climate calamity. Malaysia sees more deaths rack up and many more missing as severe floods deal a heavy blow. Fighting the fanatics. The United States takes a stand against extremism in the military with brand new rules. Pandemic panic. Omicron dominates the EU with infections surging higher than ever before. London lights up. The UK sparkles with the magic of Christmas while gearing up for the festive season. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with updates on the massive flood hit areas. Footage by National Emergency Services showed Malaysian rescuers evacuated residents in a flood hit area of the country's southern Selangor state. The video posted on the Special Malaysia Disaster and Assistance and Rescue Unit showed rescue teams in Shah Alam helping evacuate residents, some of whom were bedridden or had mobility issues. Malaysian authorities said multiple people were killed in the floods and tens of thousands of people have been displaced. Four of the dead were found in the district of Shah Alam in Selangor, where many people are still believed to be trapped in homes and apartment buildings, as rescue efforts were hampered by a lack of boats and manpower. Floods are common on the eastern coast of Malaysia during the annual monsoon season between October and March, but unusually heavy rainfall that started has put a strain on emergency services across the country. Troops race to deliver food and water to typhoon-ravaged islands of the Philippines as charities appealed to help hundreds of thousands left homeless by the deadly storm. As some residents are rescued from raging floodwaters, others are not so lucky. The death toll from Super Typhoon Rai continues to mount and in the worst hit zones, locals plead for basic necessities from authorities. In the middle of the destruction, this man holds a cardboard sign reading, I'm hungry, have mercy. Here, winds reached 195 kilometers per hour, tearing off roofs, ripping up trees and downing power lines. President Rodrigo Duterte has promised 35 million euros in aid, but some residents expressed frustration at the response. They should at least have given us one fire truck for water, but there is none. No one showed up. I don't know where the politicians and the election candidates are. Let's see when election time comes. Rai, which made landfall as a Category 5 typhoon on Thursday, sparked comparisons to Super Typhoon Haiyan in 2013, which killed more than 6,000 people in the Philippines. Although the death toll this time is not expected to get anywhere close to that number. The Philippines is hit by 20 typhoons or tropical storms each year and is ranked as one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change. The world's two largest economies, China and the U.S., are tackling their COVID-19 pandemic hit economies in different ways. While the U.S. is trying to tackle inflation through higher interest rates, China is eyeing a boost in exports to help with its own pandemic recovery. The two biggest economies in the world are moving towards opposite monetary policies to tackle the fallout of the pandemic. While the U.S. is making moves to start raising interest rates from near zero to tackle its strongest inflation in four decades, China is stepping up support for an economy under strain from a property market crackdown. In fact, on Monday, China cut its landing benchmark loan prime rate for the first time in 20 months by five basis points to 3.80 percent, while the five-year LPR remained at 4.65 percent. Experts agree that the current trend, while mostly driven by what's happening domestically, will allow China's economy to bounce back with higher exports. Until recently, the trade war between the two countries had heavily impacted China's economy, but with the two countries' different policies coming simultaneously, U.S. dollars will show strength, while Chinese yen will be cheaper, helping China's exports. As for other countries, higher interest rates will likely be followed. Experts also say that with China and the U.S. balancing out their own policies, it could actually help the global economy bounce back from the pandemic. 
The United States military is expecting major changes in how it deals with sensitive racial and religious issues within the ranks and around the country, as the Pentagon has released brand new rules in order to fight extremist behaviors. The Pentagon issued new rules on Monday, aimed at fighting extremism within the United States military. The guidelines come nearly a year after the deadly January the 6th attack on the Capitol, which dozens of current and former service members attended. U.S. Defense Department spokesman John Kirby. The vast majority of men and women in our armed forces, as of course you know, serve honorably. Uh, while extremist activity in the force is rare, any instance can have an outsized effect. The new measures include everything from prohibiting liking extremist content on social media to fundraising or demonstrating for an extremist organization. The Pentagon, however, avoided weighing in on specific scenarios, like a soldier's view of the legitimacy of Biden as president. It also stopped short of creating a list of extremist groups that military members cannot join. Groups uh, can and do change their methodology, their ideals, uh, their motivations, um, and they, re they can reform themselves. They can disband and reform into something else. And so if we got into uh, coming up with a list of extremist groups, it would be only probably as good as the day we published it, because these groups change. Monday's announcement comes just weeks after the Pentagon's Inspector General cited nearly 300 allegations of extremist activity by U.S. service members. The goals and timeline for enforcement of the new policy are unclear, including when U.S. troops might start getting punished for inappropriate use of social media. The Paris Prosecutor's Office said it has received a manslaughter lawsuit for failure to help in the tragic capsizing last month of a boat in the English Channel that cost the lives of at least 27 people trying to reach Britain. Did French and British authorities fail to protect individuals in danger? For Utopia 56, there is no doubt. The French NGO has filed a lawsuit for manslaughter against the English Channel Maritime Prefect and two other official bodies responsible for safety at sea in France. A month after 27 mainly Kurdish Iraqis lost their lives in a bid to reach the UK in the biggest ever single loss of life in the Channel. An investigation is underway on the French side. According to newspaper Le Monde, detailed extracts of phone bills showing calls made to emergency services by the police have come to light. The only two survivors told Kurdish media they called emergency services in vain as soon as the boat's motor broke down. Eventually, a French fishing boat raised the alarm, but it was already too late. The French maritime prefect confirmed they had no idea about the boat's cause of distress to have launched a rescue operation in time. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Tigrayan forces fighting the central government have withdrawn from neighboring regions in Ethiopia's north, a step towards possible ceasefire after major territorial gains by the Ethiopian military. The 13-month-old war in Africa's second most populous nation has destabilized an already fragile region and sent 60,000 refugees into Sudan, pulled Ethiopian soldiers away from war-ravaged Somalia and drawn in armed forces from neighboring Eritrea. It was a race against the clock to save the injured at this market in southern Tigray after it was hit by a military airstrike last Thursday. <laughs> For many, it was too late. Dozens were killed here. It's another attack to add to a string of atrocities that has marked the brutal war in Ethiopia. But Monday signaled a new turning point in the conflict when rebel Tigrayan forces who have been fighting central government troops announced they were withdrawing from the regions of Amhara and Afa, both located in northern Ethiopia. The TPLF spokesman tweeted that the pullouts would take away whatever excuse the international community has to explain dragging its feet when it comes to putting pressure on Abiy Ahmed and his regional partners. The rebels claimed the withdrawal should push the international community to ensure that food aid can enter Tigray. The UN has accused the Ethiopian government of placing a blockade on the region, allegations that it denies. 400,000 people are on the brink of famine there. Our concerns continue to deepen. 
particularly in regard to the ongoing conflict, its increasingly severe impact on humanitarian needs and the state of emergency that was adopted last month. The conflict in the Tigray region has, in recent months, extended to other areas of the country. It now involves an even wider range of actors with serious impact on civilians. For Abiy Ahmed, the announcement of the pullout is a cover-up for military setbacks. Since the Ethiopian Prime Minister went to the front lines to lead the fight against the TPLF, state media says the government has retaken a string of key towns. But with independent journalists unable to access conflict zones, it's hard to verify the government's claims. Moving on to the updates of the COVID pandemic. Omicron infections are multiplying rapidly across Europe and the United States, doubling every two or three days in London and elsewhere and taking a heavy toll on financial markets, which fear the impact on the global economic recovery. As a fresh wave of COVID-19 washes across Europe, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said on Monday, if needed, he would tighten curbs to slow the spread of the Omicron variant. The situation is extremely difficult and the, the arguments either way are very, very finely balanced because we've got cases of Omicron surging across the country now. We've got hospitalizations uh, rising quite steeply in uh, in London. Johnson's comments came as Omicron infections are quickly multiplying across Europe, prompting an aggressive response. The Netherlands went into shutdown Saturday, closing all but essential stores, restaurants and other public places until at least January 14th. Germany plans to limit private gatherings from December 28th to a maximum of 10 people who have been vaccinated or recovered from COVID-19, according to a draft of proposed steps. Ireland on Friday ordered bars and restaurants to close at 8 p.m. and reduced the capacity in all public events. Italy is also considering new measures. The World Health Organization warned Omicron should not be underestimated. There is now consistent evidence that Omicron is spreading significantly faster than the Delta variant. And it's more likely that people who have been vaccinated or have recovered from COVID-19 could be infected or reinfected. With COVID cases rising and testing lines growing longer, cities are adding more restrictions and at least six states in the U.S. have called in the National Guard to ease the strain on hospitalizations. A COVID surge coast to coast. Omicron now the most dominant variant, making up three quarters of cases. Testing lines and new restrictions mounting. It's time for Boston to follow the science. Boston announcing it'll require proof of vaccination starting next month for some indoor spaces. D.C. is reinstating its mask mandate. At least six states have called in the National Guard to ease the strain on hospitals, among them Maine and New Hampshire, which just hit hospitalization records. Today, downtown Los Angeles canceled its in-person New Year's celebration in Grand Park. New York City is considering whether to do the same for its bash in Times Square. The mayor saying he'll make a decision before Christmas. Thank God, based on everything we've seen far, so far, the cases are more mild than what we've experienced previously. Broadway canceling more performances, more sports teams weighing whether to postpone games, and Let's SNL see, this weekend even going live. without a yeah, live audience ready? or most of its cast. Where is everybody? Omicron cases doubling every two to three days. Ahead of the holidays, the testing lines are eerily familiar. It's been frustrating to say the least. This is my third clinic I'm going to today in the last one hour. Still, authorities insist because of vaccines, boosters and effective treatments. This is not March of 2020. It's not even December of 2020. According to the latest CDC data, here's the difference between those who are vaccinated and those who are not. Among the unvaccinated, there are 451 COVID cases per 100,000 people. Among those who are vaccinated, that number drops to 134 cases. Among those boosted, still lower, 48 cases. But here's the crucial part. Among the unvaccinated, there are six deaths per 100,000 people. Among the vaccinated, that drops considerably to 0 0.5. Among those boosted, 0 0.1. We're seeing breakthrough infections, even in elderly people. If they're boosted, it's turning out to be really mild. 
And like Pfizer before it, Moderna is out with its own data, which has not been peer-reviewed, suggesting its half-dose booster shot raises antibody levels by 37-fold. Dr. Stephen Hogue is Moderna's president, who says the company is also looking into developing another booster specific to Omicron. The European Union's drug regulator approved use of the COVID-19 vaccine from U.S.-based Novavax in people 18 years and older, paving the way for a fifth coronavirus shot in the region as the Omicron coronavirus variant spreads. Let's cross over to other there in the world news special correspondent Prashani Rodrigo from Helsinki in Finland for more. Prashani. Yes, Anuradhi. Data from two large studies showed the vaccine has an efficiency of around 90%. The European Medicines Agency said, adding that there was currently limited data on its efficiency against some variants of concern, including Omricorn. Novavax said it would start shipping vaccines to the EU's 27 member states in January. Its Nasdaq-listed shares were up about 10% in US pre-market trading, following the EU approval. Vaccines from Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna, AstraZeneca and J&J had already been approved for the use in the EU. But faced with surging infections, EMA has been speeding up reviews of other shots and treatments. Novavax's protein-based vaccine uses alternative technology to the other four shots, which makes it more interesting to the EU, as it has sought to diversity its folio, portfolio of vaccines. COVID-19's infection have broken records in parts of Europe in recent weeks, with governments and researchers scrambling to bolster defenses against the fast-speeding Omricord, prompting renewed curbs ahead of the Christmas holidays. Back to you, Anuradhi. Thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. Amid rising cases of new Omicron variant of coronavirus, France's health authority has approved COVID-19 vaccinations for children 5 to 11 years old. We have other than a World News Special Correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna from Normandy in France for more. Yes, Anurad, the Haute Authority son health regulator suggests that all parents who want it can have their children aged 5 to 11 years vaccinated. French President Emmanuel Macron has previously said he is in favor of vaccinating children, but that it needed to remain the decision of parents. The vaccine which will be administered in the pandemic formulation when it becomes widely available shows high efficacy amongst the children. France has already begun vaccinating 5 to 11 years old with medical conditions that require special protection. The European Medicines Agency, EMA, approved the use of Pfizer and Biotech's lower dose vaccine on the 5 to 11 age group in November, and several countries across the European Union have started vaccinating children in that age group. Back to you, Anuradhi. Thank you. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More World News on the other side. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. An alternative to traditional injections is currently being developed in the form of a microneedle patch. Microneedles put the substance just below the skin where there are many immune cells so the immune response can be maximized. According to market research, the South Korean tech giant Samsung takes up 43.9% of the market. The firm's market share has been rising for three straight quarters ever since recording 41% in the final quarter of 2020. According to the Central Intelligence Agency, North Korea continues to develop ballistic missiles and has a variety of missiles as of now. The report also explained Pyongyang's excessive spending on nuclear development and weapons test has led to severe economic difficulties for the regime. New Zealand postponed its phased border reopening plans until the end of February over concerns of the rapid global spread of the Omicron variant of the coronavirus. Non-quarantine travel, which was to have opened for New Zealanders in Australia from January 16th, would be pushed back until the end of February. Chinese tennis star Peng Shuai has denied she made accusations of sexual assault against a former Chinese vice premier Zhang Gaoli. In a video interview by Singapore Media Out Outlet Peng shared that she had never said or written that anyone had sexually assaulted her. And finally tonight, 
London has been lit up as the Christmas season approaches with its landmarks wreathed in sparkling decorations. In Trafalgar Square, the Christmas tree sent to the UK by Norway as an annual gift following British support for Norway during the World War II takes centre stage next to a nativity scene. London's shopping districts celebrate with themes including illuminated angels and butterflies, while more modern lights are seen outside Wembley Stadium and on London's cultural hub, the South Bank. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other than English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Suzanne Shanali will join you again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Anradhi Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great night.